that, well, maybe some of the former, re recent former residents do. Uh, I'm big into so-called evidence-based medicine, which I think is like the worst term ever invented. It's like, you know, arrogant and everything else. Um, I'm up for more practical uses of the literature, and how do you find an answer quickly, not doing a literature search that takes an hour and things like that. So I'm going to try to give you some quick ideas here. Um, the one caveat is to do this easily, you have to be connected to the internet. <laughs> so gone are the days, and I well remember them, of, you know, sort of piecing through uh, uh, various paper resources to find this. So let's take off and, and go through pretty quickly. Um, who knows Mitch Caper? Not personally, but... Well, if you're really old like me, and remember programs like Lotus 1, 2, 3, and things like that, he started that. Uh, if you're not so old, but you know about Firefox, the browser search engine, that's who this is. Smart, interesting guy. Uh, when I was in medical school seriously, which is somewhere around here, there were a neighborhood of 2,500 sort of randomized or therapeutic trials published annually. Now we're at about tenfold that. So yes, there are more articles out there to keep up with, but the good news is you don't really need to because most of them aren't helpful. And the second thing is, to people who whine about too many things to read and keep up with, this is uh, neither mine nor Dr. Einhorn's contemporary, Mr. Gutenberg and his press, predated both of us by a few years. That's when it hit the fan. That's when there was too much to read that anybody could possibly keep up with. So it's been, you know, 500 years and more that we haven't been able to read everything we want to read. So don't worry about it. It's fine. <laughs> now, there are various ways to cope with too much literature. This is probably self-explanatory. <laughs> and, I, and I have to say, I've, I've been all of these birds at one point or another, sometimes all four in the same day. So I've definitely hidden my head in the sand. The, the pigeon here is meant to represent the person who sort of picks up tidbits of things here and there. You go to CME, that's great. The pharmaceutical rep comes to your office, you glance at whatever propaganda they give you. I mean, that's, that's all okay. You got to be a little wary about the source. Um, the owl, I tried to be an owl for a long time. That was really stupid. Just keep track of every question I ever had, do a formal literature search, really gather all the data. So, you know, given that it's estimated that for every patient you see in the office, you generate about one and a half to two new questions you'd like to know the answer to. So the OWL approach, you could probably see one patient a day. <laughs> so unless you're independently wealthy, I don't recommend that. Uh, are, are there any bird watchers here? Anybody know these guys? No? <clears throat> and this is from the British Medical Journal. It's the jackdaw. I mean, who knew? <laughs> but uh, jackdaws, they're sort of like a pigeon. They do pick up tidbits, but they're attracted to shiny objects. So my approach, at least here, is the jackdaw approach. Try to find those shiny objects. They're easy to spot. You get them quickly. You get an answer. Or 
if you like the drinking analogy, rather than a fire hose, we want a civilized cappuccino. So what we're going to mention very quickly here is how to answer a question that comes up in practice that you'd really like to know the answer to, but do it in a few minutes rather than a few hours. So that you could potentially do it in the midst of your practice day. And then another just sort of plea that it's one thing to look up questions as they occur, but sometimes you don't know what to ask because it hasn't occurred to you. You don't know what's out there. So some sort of browsing plan is good. And coming to conferences like this is a little bit like browsing. You know, you're just seeing what's out there, what people are talking about. So. Uh, this is actually a true story. Uh, the pediatrician who had this patient uh, didn't give me permission to talk about it, but she's still married to me, but I won't, I won't mention her name. <clears throat> but she had a 19-year-old gentleman at an unnamed local hospital who had pneumonia but got admitted to the adult ICU at this hospital and cared for, and then, and she didn't even know about it, uh, then got transferred out of the ICU and transferred to the pediatric floor, and she got the call to come take care of her ICU transfer uh, that she didn't know anything about. And he was on IV levofloxacin. How many of you have used levofloxacin? <laughs> Dr. Schwartz, he doesn't count, he's a ringer of one other. A few. Yeah, it's not very commonly used in pediatrics. It's becoming more common. <clears throat> and he had a, not quite a million lab tests and imaging studies performed in the ICU, and his mycoplasma IgM antibody was positive. Uh, so this pediatrician sought advice from any number of people. Um, uh, three listed here that had three different answers. I'm surprised, you know, if you ask three people sort of a question with an unclear answer, usually you're going to get five or six answers. So, but this was only three answers from three people. Um, so the question is, no real consensus, what do you do if you've never used levofloxacin before? And that gets us into uh, my favorite book that I've never been able to get all the way through. And I really date myself here. And I won't ask if anybody's even heard of this. But uh, part of the part that I did get through, I got to uh, Proverbs for Paranoids number three. Uh, and I think it really applies here. And to some of the frustration we all have when we try to find the answer in the literature and we can't find it, because we're asking the wrong question. And recently, I've discovered a corollary that I'll tra take credit for. <laughs> Sometimes you ask the right question, but you're asking the wrong person. And you're still going to get the wrong answer. So it's sort of like going to the oracle at Delphi. Um, I, I don't know how much the oracle knows about levofloxacin, frankly. But it's a big deal to go to the Oracle at Delphi and get advice. And that's not something you're going to do on your lunch break uh, in the middle of the day at the office. So make sure you're asking the right question and the right person or the right source. And this is from a standard evidence-based medicine textbook. I still use it. Um, because I think it's helpful in sort of categorizing how you're going to look for an answer. Are you looking for background or foreground? The difference meaning, is this something you've heard of but don't know much about and you need to fill in some background information? And that may be the case with levofloxacin. Never used it, never thought about using it that much. Or is it foreground? Uh, like I had a couple weeks ago, a uh, patient I suspected of a uh, uh, kind of cockle hepatic cysts, huge cysts. Um, 
I went to my Akanakakis folder, still paper folder, in my cabinet and discovered it was 2006 was the last time I had to worry about it. Uh, I needed to see what the latest and greatest information about aconococcal disease was. That's more of a foreground question. Not that I remembered absolutely everything about aconococcal disease, although I try. So background, any textbook, any source you want. Uh, so I've listed a couple others there, MD Consult, Up to Date. We'll talk a little bit about Up to Date because I know people love it. Foreground, it's a little bit harder. Uh, search engines, I mentioned in particular guidelines.gov as a website because sometimes there are practice guidelines out there. Just because you find it on that site doesn't mean it's a good guideline. Uh, anybody can get it on there if it's published on the web somewhere or somewhere available electronically. Um, but it's useful if you've got the whole thing there. And then by secondary sources, I mean these are sources that have already done some searching for you, um, may be more current than your standard printed textbook. <coughs> We'll go through a couple studies really quickly. Uh, how many of you, be honest now, have searched for medical information through Google? So most, not 100%, but I think the people that didn't raise their hands are lying. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and I used to look down on my nose at Google, but I don't anymore. I use it all the time. And I'll show you how, and I'll show you why. Uh, there was a study uh, uh, several years ago that took the, you know, those case records from the Mass General in the New England Journal, and they put in the symptoms to Google and see, saw how often it came up with the correct diagnosis, and it was 58% of the time. I don't know if that's good or bad, but um, it might be um, not so bad since these are supposed to be stumper cases. Um, and then there was like a head-to-head -head trial against PubMed, sort of the tradition, gener traditional generic search engine, and Google. And so these authors basically, you know, knew the answers in advance and then saw how easy it was to find through PubMed or Google. And Google did just as well. Of the 83 conditions or studies that were out there to find, PubMed and Google found about the same. Uh, the problem was, as you know in Google, the denominator is huge. And you don't know if your study is number 80,729 or not and I would guarantee very few of us go down that far. So that's one of the disadvantages of Google, but it wasn't bad. PubMed, there's a shortcut, and if you just need a quick answer, but it's sort of foreground material, and, and I mentioned PubMed because it's free and you can get it anywhere that you can get um, internet access, go to clinical queries. It'll be in there at the opening menu because that's doing your search for you. And we'll uh, show a little bit of that later. Uh, this was another study um, that allowed people options to use Google, Ovid, PubMed, or UpToDate to find answers to clinical questions in real time in a hospital-based setting. UpToDate won. But the confounding factor in here is that not, not everybody was equally uh, um, prone to use or experience in using all of the resources. So it may be a thing of we're up to date one because that's what most people used anyway. Head-to-head uh, -head PubMed versus up to date. Uh, and this was looking just at 
uh, again, trying to answer a clinical question in so-called real time in a hospital-based setting, whether they couldn't get the answer at all, partial answer, or got the full and correct answer. And people could choose whether to use PubMed alone or start with PubMed and then try up-to-date, up-to-date alone, or start with up-to-date and then go to PubMed if they couldn't find it. Again, a little biased. Uh, uh, in part because it's not clear whether the PubMed people had access to the clinical queries or not. They had a, a rigged PubMed. Uh, and also more of the people were, were familiar with up-to-date versus PubMed. Uh, this is something, though, that has caused me to abandon up-to-date for foreground information. And it's something I suspected before this study came out. Up to date isn't so up to date. So these, this was a study of 128 sort of key uh, advances in clinical practice throughout a variety of specialties and conditions. And so the authors of this study looked at how long it took these various resources to incorporate these studies into their advice. And the clear winner by far was Dynamed, which is what I use. Unfortunately, you have to pay for it, uh, but less, I think, less than up to date, I'm not sure. And the other unfortunate thing is it doesn't have as complete pediatric information as up to date. Um, so I don't mean to trash up to date, some of my best friends write for it. Um, and also, disclaimer, I write for Dynamed, although they don't pay me anything, so uh, I don't get anything by mentioning it. Uh, Dynamed will give you sort of a nice outline. The thing I like about it is you can, if you want, uh, this is further down on the screen, you can click on a link and it actually puts you in the clinical queries section already filled out in PubMed. So if you think that this is something, I think I made this screenshot a couple weeks ago, the most recent update was May 1st, 2012. Um, but if I wanted to see what was new in the past month, uh, if I wasn't finding the answer there, I could go in one click to see what was new in the past month. Uh, Google. I did Lyme disease tests. Uh, unfortunately, the first things that appear are mostly these specialty labs, uh, especially on the advertising side. Uh, but a little further down, and what I tend to do in Google is really focus on the green. So I'm trying to look for some website that sounds reputable, like EDU or Gov or something like that. Um, but if I don't find it in the first couple screens, I'm going to abandon it. The nice thing about Google, if you find a, a good article that's on track but maybe not perfect, you can then put that article into PubMed. And whenever you search on an article, PubMed will give you a list of related articles. And then you can see if any of the related articles help you out. And there's the, what appears in a standard clinical queries in PubMed. This happens to be for diagnosis, but you can use it on therapy and prognosis. There are original clinical studies. There are systematic reviews, uh, genetic applications, which you may not have a lot of use for. But it's a quick way to get to some decent information. So I recommend that for foreground searches. Well, the young man did fine, stayed on levofloxacin, and that was something that probably just took a background search to see, you know, what agents it's active against, what the experience is in pneumonia. You could do up to date or anything reasonable to find the answer. <clears throat> just a pitch quickly for browsing. Um, I subscribe to electronic table of contents updates for about 45 journals. I don't recommend that. 
but because of what I do and who I teach, I have to keep ahead of the, the game for things like that. But good primary sources for browsing I list here. And secondary sources uh, you all probably know about. Uh, so just to review very quickly, Google's okay, you have my permission to search in Google. Clinical queries in PubMed. Keep some textbooks around, whether they're in print or electronic. Dynamed maybe. Maybe you can get like a free introductory offer. Uh, but don't worry about the fire hose, just sip a cappuccino. And that's uh, also a shameless plug for my other blog, which I post uh, weekly uh, for the American Academy of Pediatrics, which is more on evidence-based review of the literature. And with that, I'll stop. And uh, I'm a couple minutes over the total, I think. So. We're, we're doing great. Um, One question while we bring up uh, Ivor and Terry, and then actually at the end of their presentation, will you still be here? So these two sort of dovetail a bit, so there may be questions just about sort of this whole area of information. But go ahead, Drew, ask a question. Uh, I wonder if you comment on, because uh, there's certainly a lot of interest in the development of uh, cost effective research and uh, patient satisfaction and research. If you could give us your advice and counsel on how to digest and interpret those studies. Yeah, this, this is great, near and dear to my heart, about cost effectiveness research, our practical outcomes, patient-centered outcomes, things like that. This is absolutely the way to go, and I think one of the cornerstones of evidence-based medicine that's glossed over, because people are so worried about arithmetic that you really shouldn't spend a lot of time on. It's really, uh, how do you incorporate the patient's values and, and desired outcomes into sort of developing a plan of action? So on the one hand, it's, you know, how can you, for example, if you're talking about mortality, how can you put a price on a life saved? Uh, but there are standard research methods to do that if you, you know, accept the assumptions and things. But that's going to be really the most important wave of, of clinical medicine in the future. You know, we have beautiful randomized placebo-controlled double-blind trials, but it's in a setting that's not realistic for most of our patients. You know, there's a research nurse calling the patient every day and careful follow-up and all that. That's not what we do in the real world. So can we do pragmatic trials or practical trials that really focus on a, an actual clinical setting or variety of settings so it's, uh, it becomes more feasible. Not every one of your patients with Lyme disease will exactly fit into you know, the eligibility criteria for that randomized controlled trial. So that's not maybe directly applicable to your clinical question. So as we get, and there really is a huge wave of research going on to recognize that, you know, we've been in an ivory tower for a long time, but sometimes that doesn't translate well. Thanks, bud.